So it's not often I actually uh, throw about the suggestion that uh, a movie is basically perfect. I mean, I don't actually think that the actual literal perfect movie actually exists. I don't think it ever will. But there are plenty of movies actually out there that uh, I feel like I'm really close. Just on top of my head, uh, I think Ghostbusters is certainly pretty close. I think Groundhog Day uh, is another one. And certainly Back to the Future. Just because I, I feel it has everything uh, and everything it attempts to do and everything it needs to do the greatest kind of effects you could really expect it to. It has uh, been my all-time favourite film for quite a few years now, and I honestly don't think that's ever going to change. But I thought maybe a couple of years ago when I saw Ex Machina that that might uh, change things a little bit, that might uh, overtake it. But after watching it again, I sort of feel like Back to the Future has a bit more to it, really. It's, it's got a bit more variety to it. It's a, it's a bit more sort of fun. I want to talk today about uh, Back to the Future because uh, I was discussing it with a friend the other day. He brought up an interesting point that uh, the protagonist, Marty, is kind of unusual in terms of the typical sort of protagonists that you see in this kind of story, in that uh, there's no real sort of obvious flaw with him at the start of the movie. He doesn't really change very much during the movie, if at all. You know, there's, there's no real sort of definitive or major characteristic to him that sort of defines the movie or becomes a, a key reason to why he is the central character of the movie. He is basically about as normal as you can get to, for a film's protagonist and he actually doesn't really achieve or do very much for himself during the whole film. He very much for the most part just sort of goes along with what the doc is uh, doing and saying throughout the whole thing. Uh, even the decision to go back in time, it's not a decision he really makes for himself, it's just something he's sort of forced to do um, because of unfortunate circumstances. You know, there's only really sort of two things that he sort of does for himself during the film, and that's um, going to find the dock in 1955, which is kind of just a sort of common sense thing, you know, anybody in his situation would probably have done the same thing. Uh, and the other thing is coming up with the plan for George to go and save Lorraine at the uh, dance. Uh, that was sort of his idea, and uh, he sort of infiltrates everything that sort of happens there. But in terms of change and, uh, you know, an arc or a revelation kind of stuff, it's much more about his father, George, than it, it is about Marty. Marty is just kind of the unfortunate sort of victim of the circumstances and the situation, and uh, he's basically just the sort of eyes that we see the film through. You know, he, he's, he's sort of essentially just us. Way. He's, he's just there to sort of observe the situation and suffer from some of the circumstances sort of be the reason that the film even exists somebody has to go back in time and it, it's just it happens to be him but the story is really more about the characters that he meets and uh, what happens to them because the change is in George because you know obviously because of uh, Marty going back and uh, changing circumstances slightly uh, the future is then changed but uh, here's uh, the sort of interesting thing that um, kind of has me a little bit puzzled actually uh, when I really started thinking about it. Obviously, the only reason why the present, uh, when Marty gets back to 1985, is different is because of things that Marty must have done in 1955 to alter things. And what he altered was the circumstances in which his mother and father meet. Now, it's obvious uh, that he, he um, is the reason why they don't meet as a result of uh, Lorraine's father hitting George with a car. But uh, the thing that I didn't quite follow um, for a while was uh, how did Marty's involvement with the past caused them to get together um, in the circumstances of George standing up to Biff and then punching him in the face. You know, what, what was it that Marty did that caused George to make that decision to stand up to Biff and say, no Biff, you leave her alone, and then a couple of minutes later punch him? Because Marty's not there when that happens, so what is, is it exactly that Marty does that um, inspires or influences George in such a way that he now makes the decision to stand up to Biff? I've heard some people sort of suggest that maybe it's just because it's something he was forced to do, you know, because he's forced into a situation where the only real option is to stand up to Biff. He decides he is going to do it. In the original timeline, he was never faced with that situation. It was always like, well, I can probably just go along with what Biff's saying here. You know, there's no real sort of downside to this. Whereas in this situation, which obviously only comes about, and also the reason why Biff is there is because of the uh, crash in the Manila truck, which uh, obviously was Marty as well. So the only reason this new situation exists is because of Marty. And because George is faced with this situation, the only option he feels at this point is that he has to stand up to Biff because the alternative is just to simply allow Biff to rape Lorraine and that's maybe just going too far. So that I think is probably the reason why 
George decides to stand up to Biff is because he's faced with a situation where the downside is just way too much for even him to even accept. You know, in, in the past, maybe he's been faced with uh, sort of the situation where, well, if I go along with what Biff says here, it's not too bad. It's it's not the end of the world or anything. Whereas it, now he's faced with a situation where, if he goes along with what Biff is saying, it's just too awful. It's just too much, uh, even for him to deal with. The punch probably is just I, a direct result of. Uh, a lot of built-up rage and a lot of built-up frustration inside George uh, over the number of years of just going along with what Biff has said to him and uh, he's just let it all out. So I think the reason why George is inspired to stand up to Biff there is basically just because he's faced with that situation, whereas in the original timeline he wasn't. I've also heard this theory sort of suggest that uh, maybe it's just time readjusting itself. Now there's a theory about time travel that uh, if you go back in time and alter from certain things or stop them from happening, time can then readjust to ensure that even though the way in which things happen might be different, the ultimate outcome is still the same. So George and Lorraine were always going to get together, regardless of how you tried to interfere with it or how you may have tried to stop it. Uh, time was always going to readjust and have George and Lorraine get together in some other way. Those, those are both uh, theories I'm perfectly fine with. I don't have any problem with that part of the film. It's the scene a little bit after that that actually uh, has me a little bit puzzled. The scene where the guy is singing Earth Angel and George and Lorraine kiss. As far as I can tell from what we're told in the film, that happens in the original timeline because we see Lorraine at the start of the film talk about how she and George kissed on the dance floor and that was what made Lorraine realise that uh, she was going to spend the rest of her life with him. Bit cheesy, but you know, we'll let it slide. I am assuming that that scene that we see at the end of the film where he's singing Earth Angel and they kiss is pretty much how it happens in the original timeline. And I don't see anything that has happened prior to that to suggest that uh, it would have happened any differently. Fine. But here's the thing that I don't quite get, because there is a bit just before that where this gingerhead guy who, as far as I'm aware, we've not actually seen it prior <laughs> To that point in the film, so it's, it was kind of weird, just who the hell's that? Uh, he comes in and he pushes Lorraine out of the way. I guess it's sort of implied that uh, previously George would have just walked off and said, oh, okay, well, I guess she's gone. And I guess to sort of imply that George is a changed man, we now see him come back and push the gingerhead guy out of the way. But if that only happens because George is a changed man, I, I, I love that scene, by the way. I think it's a great scene to just sort of emphasize how George has changed. I think that's a really good way to get the point across. If that only happens because George is a changed man, then what happened in the original timeline, where obviously he isn't changed and he's never had he's never had to stand up to Biff or anything, he learned this lesson about not just letting people push him around and uh, you know actually sort of doing what he really sort of wants to do and having the courage to stand up to other people. Did uh, the gingerhead guy just not cut in and take Lorraine away from him in the original timeline? And if he didn't, then why not? Because he was still in the original timeline, and uh, he, he presumably was still the same kind of person that we see in the film in the original timeline, because we haven't seen him prior to that point, so nothing's really happened to change him as a person. You're either saying that in the original timeline George stood up to this gingerhead guy, but apparently wouldn't stand up to Biff, or you're saying to me that that, that part didn't happen in the original timeline, and if it didn't, then why didn't it happen? The only thing I can think is because the uh, Earth Angel number is delayed slightly because you know Marty's stuck in that trunk and uh, the guy injures his hand, so uh, they make the decision that the dance is over until Marty comes forward and says he'll play guitar for them. So it's possible because of that, in the original timeline, the Earth Angel number may have happened slightly earlier, and maybe the gingerhead guy just wasn't around at that point. You know, maybe he was in the toilet or something. And the only other thing I can think, you know, maybe they were dancing on a different part of the dance floor for for some reason that George his mind may have been in a different place at that point because he would have gone to the dance with Lorraine. They would have had a chance much earlier in the night maybe to have a kiss perhaps because they would have been there for the whole night in the original timeline. Maybe they kissed like right when they got there perhaps and so by the time the Earth Angel song came along you know maybe that ginger egg guy did cut in line but by, because they'd already kissed at that point Lorraine was like no no no. But those are just sort of theories that I have you know there's nothing in the film to say that either is or isn't what happened. That is really something that uh, I have just sort of noticed recently in watching the film. And I've been watching this film for like, about 15 years now and I've only just noticed it. So it's obviously not a huge problem, but it is something that kind of bugs me. So I'm interested to know if you guys have any kind of ideas, you know, do you think that gingerhead guy did push Lorraine out the way in the original timeline or is that just something that Marty has influenced in some kind of way? Do you think uh, 
that is also a case of time readjusting in some kind of way. Let me know what uh, you guys think. Did Georgia and Lorraine kiss in the same circumstances in the original timeline, or did things pan out slightly differently there as well? Okay, that's that, guys. Yeah.